first on film and entertainment. And hey, listen, Gregory King and Peter Krause, I'm not very entertained this week. You can ask me why. Okay, Thanks. why? Hang on, there was this dead silence. What, what, what's this dead silence? When, when I give you prompts, you know, like your actors, you've got to sort of fulfill your roles. The, thank you, Gregory, for asking me. Very kind of you. Gee, un, unprovoked and so forth. Because there's no football, Greg. I'm so sad. I mean, what do I, well, yeah, yes, there is. Sorry, I should be, uh, because people are going to ring in and abuse me. There's AFLW. I'm extremely thank happy you, about As you say, Alice, there's no football. Don't, oh, oh, gee, that's controversial. No, I mean, I'd like AFLW to be played as curtain raisers so that basically those people who enjoy football can see both sides of the coin. I mean, why not? Why don't we have AFLW matches before AFL matches? Can you explain that for me? Uh, Done. Thank you. Really? No. Well, maybe that we've now got a, a new person, a 33-year-old who's highly regarded Whose, no, whose surname is Keen in, in in charge of all these football operations? Maybe she can make this happen because I'm a, I'm a bit concerned. There, there there was some conversation the other day that the AFLW would be as popular as the Matildas. I think there's a long way to go, Greg. Do you not? Given what yes. we've just seen, I think there's a long way to go. I think the AFL has rushed into uh, putting 18 teams up. They sort of slowly build it up, build up the few teams they had first. Get, get it to a, a standard where it excites the crowds and people will turn up and be happy to pay to turn up rather than what they have at the moment, which is uh, short quarters, um, low scores in some cases, and mainly only family and friends turn up. Although on, we, on, although on Friday night, the reigning premiers did a good job, 10 goals against uh, Collingwood, who kicked four. So, yeah, I mean, okay, it's not the scores that you get in AFL. The other thing is that I, I'm not... I mean, they did build it up because it took a while for teams like Essendon to be in the competition. You're saying it could have taken longer. The yeah. the only issue for me, longer. yeah, the only issue for me, quite frankly, is the standard that is slowly increasing, but it's going to take a long time to get to the level. I mean, I really enjoy watching women's cricket. I also really enjoy watched. I, I love watching the Matildas. So there are, and tennis as well. Women's tennis is fantastic, and female swimmers. I mean, boy, our our swimming team, the girls just dominate. It's fantastic, and the girls dominate through the Barbie movie, one of the the top twenty movies of all time. So you know, there, there's every reason to believe that it can be built up. I just want the standards to continue to increase, and the sooner that happens, the better. And I think that's going to draw crowds. Do you not? I think, uh, Alex. I think that the success of the Matildas will draw more women, girls, towards playing soccer than it will to AFL. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, there's a threat there, quite frankly, to AFL or AFLW. So yeah, you know, pull your fingers out. And it's great. The competition between sports is healthy, in my opinion. So that's one thing. The second thing is that your team, in spite of the odds against it, St Kilda has made the finals. Now that is very exciting, Greg. Are you, you know, how optimistic are you? Because nobody really expects you to go more than, let's say, perhaps one win in the finals. Well, that's likely to happen now that we, we've got a home final, but it's not played in our home ground. So, who is AFL? Oh, well, hang on, hang on, wait a second. I, when I say nobody, of course, and Kilda supporters, and there may be a few few others, th you're saying to me that everything's fair about the draw and where games are played? I mean, come on. No, this, is just a, this is just another example of the lack of integrity in the competition. Sorry. No, 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 hang on, hang on. If you were the one who was scheduling not just the finals but throughout the year clearly there are some blockbuster games unless you play each team just once that would be the only thing it's happened during the COVID years yes yeah yeah but unless you did that and every second year you'd play at the home ground of one of the two teams yes. unless you did that and you shorten the season or double the season you're not going to get the integrity through the year anyway are you and well you know, over three years and everyone plays each other Three times over the course of three years, it's easy to do. You have your 17 games, then you start all over again in the other ground. Right. Well, then you just keep rolling it on. How can that work out? 17 in, in. Yeah, and then seven is 24. Then you start again, the last, uh, the next 10, and then you go again. Oh, okay. So somebody somebody on the line. Now, hang on. Peter Kraus, are you totally bamboozled? Are you a mathematician? Are you following what Gregory King is telling us? Not at all. I'm just uh, oh. doing a crossword puzzle while we're talking. Oh, no. <laughs> no. 
Well, Greg, I wish you well anyway next weekend. I hope it goes swimmingly for you and you've exceeded expectations. You've got to acknowledge that. You're, yeah, you're, but we play, coach. Only, we, only, we play finals only two years ago, remember? I know, but your new old coach has done a really good job. And not only unfinished that... business. Pardon me? He calls it unfinished business. Unfinished business, but but hang on. GW. He took us to two grand finals um, when he was last coaching, but we never won one, so he calls it unfinished business. Fair enough. But, I mean, he's not the only one. Bear in mind the GWS coach has done a marvellous job as well. So... You know, it, I, I suppose my my question, without notice to you, is given the standing of Alistair Clarkson and also Damien Hardwick, where just this is really really early. Where do you think North Melbourne and the Gold Coast will finish next year? And I, I, this is going to be going to the memory bank. So just give me a prediction. Let's go with North Melbourne. What position after the final oh, next year? Still bottom bottom half. No, no. Um, give me an actual. I'll give you a pro- prognostication. You give me one. I'm I'm going to say. That they will finish thirteenth. What do you think, North Melbourne next? Probably around 12, 12, 12 14, Okay, yeah. right. Gold Coast. Mm. Pretty much the same, I think. So what we're talking twelve, thirteen. Yeah. Really? Yeah, okay. Love the ladder again. Oh, look, if Damien Hardwick can't get a can't get him up to a grand final within five years, Gold Coast may as well fold. I, I'm going to say eighth next year. I'll say eighth. I think Very they've got the team. Pardon me. Very optimistic. Yeah, I just th- I think they've got the. I-, I know that he said eighty percent of the teams there, whether it's sixty percent or seventy or whatever it might be. I think they've got the kernel of a really good side, and it's a question of. I, I feel sorry for Stuart Jew. I really do because he, he's a good coach, but yeah, there's been a number of good coaches that haven't been able to get the most out of them. They- I'd like to think that they're on their way. Hopefully not at Essendon's expense because we finished the season as the worst performing side of any of the 18, including West Coast and North Melbourne. To lose by 196 points in the last two games was appalling, Gregory, appalling. So now I can only hope that Carlton gets knocked out. As you know, my love of Carlton. Carlton gets knocked out first round. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Hey, hey. I don't hate Carlton as much as you do, Alex. I just worry. I don't hate Carlton as much as you do, obviously, but there you go. Anyway, when we just start talking films, we can do that, Gregory. Uh, we can we can do that for all for all it's worth. I want to start with a, a general question. By the way, you are on Jay Air eighty eight FM, and you're listening to us talking about football. No, you're also going to be listening to us talking about movies and some shows. Wanted to ask both of you. Start with you, Peter. In terms of violence in society, translating to violence on screen, translating to violent video games, to bad behaviour in the retail environment, in schools, at home. It's been a a discussion over many years. You then get movies like The Equalizer 3, which we're about to discuss, and many others, Liam Neeson, revenge thrillers and movies like that, where we've got really fine actors, Equalizer 3, Denzel Washington, Liam Neeson, obviously, we just mentioned, and Bruce Willis in the past and many, many other action heroes who are kicking butt, they're stabbing, they're shooting, they're pulverizing, they're doing all of these things, and it's being marketed as entertainment. And I enjoy, you know, the the, the good guys getting their own back, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I seriously wonder whether it translates in the brain if you constantly see this sort of stuff. And the level of violence, especially in The Equalizer 3, is immense. Your thoughts? Well, for me, I don't think there's a causal relationship. There's no definitive study that shows uh, a relationship between viewing violence and committing violence. There's certainly um, suggestions of it, Peter. There's certainly suggestions. Now, I'm well, only... I mean, it goes... Look, think all the way back to Clockwork Orange, which, oh, yeah. uh, which, uh, for example, was supposedly uh, created all of this mayhem and violence amongst young people, which was not the case. And, and, I mean, violence has been in movies since the turn of the century with the Westerns and uh, uh, and shootings and so on. So, no, I don't think there is any causal relationship at all. So you don't want any sanitization? Like, we've, got, we've obviously got equalization or trying to be equal with regards to various races, various sexes, etc. So is this not just one step further down that road kicking the can? No, I don't think so. I think it, it, filmmakers are, are entitled to do what they think is, is best for their film. And uh, if there is violence in uh, some members of the audience, etc., it's because it's already been there in the first place. 
and uh, the film has not triggered it. What's illegitimate? And I asked that question, and I'm deliberately being provocative here, of course, but I asked that question because is there anything verboten? So I'm thinking about Salo, for example, which had graphic violence and also pedophilia. So, is, and that was banned for, for many, many years in Australia. Is anything bannable, for want of a better word? Is there anything that's uh, off limits? Well, I would say no, apart from maybe those snuff movies that were popular in the 70s uh, among some people and uh, and depicted actual violence on people. But I think most people know that film is a creation. Mm, that's interesting. I But it, it can also act as a trigger, Greg King, and it I... I I just worry. I do worry if you're already unstable, you go in, your mates are, are cajoling you to, to have a bit of fun with something and it sets you off. Are you not concerned? I, I'm with, I agree with Peter on this thing. It, 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 there's violence in the movies for a long time. I know, know nowadays it's a lot, lot more um, depicted with, you know, blood and guts and body parts and everything, but violence has always been part of the cinema. I don't think it, it uh, actually triggers people. As Peter said, you know, the concept probably must have been there in the back of mind sometimes, but I don't think there's any reason to ban the violence from the cinemas, in the cinemas, um, or anything like that. It, I, only a couple of other films have been banned in Australia. Ken Park, I know of. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Base Moore, I remember that, the altercation about that one when um, the Lumiere was showing it and the um, federal police confiscated and that. Well, been banned it. Piss Christ was a, as a, uh, an artwork that uh, was very controversial as well. Yeah. So, look, controversy and, I suppose, art forms do go together. I wonder, unfortunately, Jackie Hamilton couldn't be with us today, but maybe it's a conversation we'll have with her next time that she's on because I, I know that she's not somebody who, who likes unbridled violence, and yet she's got some thoughts that she's given us, which I'll share later on The Equaliser 3. So let's talk a little bit about it. The Kimura is in the sights of this mysterious former government operative called Robert McCall, and he's the character played by Denzel Washington. And The Equaliser 3, by the way, is 109 minutes, and it's rated M8. It's violent, and it's action-filled. And it's the third and final film, obviously, in a trilogy, when I say that. Good thing, you can watch this one in isolation, make sense of it, even if you haven't seen the others, which is great. Antoine Fakwa is the one who's directing it. He's worked on five Denzel Washington movies. I think there's another director who's worked in with Denzel five times as well, and I can't recall his name. Does any any of you do? There's there are two directors who worked with Denzel five times. Anyway, the um, and Antoine Foucault. Uh, Cody's plot. Thank you. Very good indeed. Uh, first two Equalizer movies came out in 2014 and 2018, and writing all of them, Richard Wink. Right. So you've got Richard Wink and Antoine Foucault who have come together again. Now let's go to the the plot. You've got. Robert McCall, a man whose life has really been defined by violence, but he wants to put all of that behind him after finishing one really nasty job in Sicily. He leaves behind quite a mess. There's bodies lying everywhere inside this, this great mansion, and yet there's not a mark on his body. But upon exiting, he's badly wounded from an unexpected source, despite that he drives away and he then collapses while driving and he's effectively saved by the quick actions of a police chief called Giorgio, Giorgio Benucci and Benucci immediately transports him to well-regarded and diplomatic Dr. Enzo Arisio, who knows not to ask too many questions. Recovery, because this is where he's heading to, is this small picturesque seaside town on the Amalfi coast, which McCall quickly takes a shine to, only it turns out to be anything but peaceful. There's a mafia shootout, and a mafia offshoot is strong-arming the locals, including a fishmonger and the chief of police, who I've already referenced. And as this violence escalates, try as he does, McCall can't help himself, and therefore becomes this one-man vigilante force. Same time, he puts in an anonymous call to a young CIA analyst called Emma Collins, played by Dakota Fanning, and he tells her of this major drug importation ring. And it isn't long before the CIA is in full operational mode and Emma is receiving further guidance from McCall. So that's the Equaliser 3. And Denzel Washington, 
He's a very, very fine actor in these sorts of movies. No question, he's his usual polished, poised, professional self. And he oozes menace, but he also oozes charm. He's a ruthless assassin, frequently underestimated, somebody not to be messed with. It's all about his calm demeanour, his can-do attitude. So he's confident, absolutely. Cocky, no. Most noteworthy is his piercing glare that signals that he's watching and waiting to strike. So, who are the others? Well, Remo Carone, he presents as a decent and trustworthy medic. Eugenio Mastrandria is stoic but understandably shaken as the policeman in the firing line with his horrified family watching. Dakota Fanning, well, she plays determined but wet behind the ears as the quick on, well, she's quick on the uptake. She's a CIA analyst who spars with and learns from McCall. And then there's a glint in the eyes of a cafe barista called Amina, played by Gaia Scudolaro, who, who takes a bit of a shine to McCall. And there's brothers, Marco and Vincent Caranta. They're played by Andrea Dodero and Andrea Scarduzio, and they run the operation to basically, they're, they're their sort of uh, mafia hitmen. They're cast as pure evil. They, they relish inflicting pain and anguish, and they are out to achieve their ambition of complete dominance and control over this beautiful part of the Italian coastline. So, warning, 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 a number of scenes in The Equaliser 3 are particularly vicious and bloody. You may well want to look away at certain points. In contrast, wow, landscape, cinematography thereof. Robert Richardson is the cinematographer. Breathtaking, absolutely magical, real picture postcard material. I just, I was salivating looking at this place, thinking I've got to see it. I've got to go and see this part of Italy. It, it was shot in a different place than what is represented, but I want to see it. I really do. I, I actually found The Equalizer 3 brutal, but strangely compelling, to be honest. And I mean, just to give you some idea, and it, it's kind of interesting because I talked earlier about, or prompted you to talk about violence in, in cinema. This is Jackie's view. And as I say, Jackie normally doesn't like wanton violence, in my, my opinion, based on the conversations I've had with her, but she can speak for herself next time. But this is what she says about... The Equalizer 3. Denzel Washington saves one of the most beautiful places in the world. My guilty pleasure. I could watch Denzel just try tying shoelaces all day if it weren't for the scene to gaze at. There you go. So she obviously uh, found this to be quite compelling and doesn't even mention the violence. What about you mentioning violence, Greg? Your thoughts about The Equalizer 3? Oh, look, I, I, I enjoyed his actual point there. I agree he's, he's fairly violent there. Um, and it's a different take on the character of Robert McCall's uh, Edward Woodward's portrayal in the 80s TV series there. Here he's much more um, open to using violence there. Um, this is a different collaboration between the director, Antoine Fuqua, and Washington. And I think Antoine Fuqua knows how to bring out sort of Denzel Washington's mean streak in him. He often, play, he often plays the good guy, but this director seems to bring out the um, nasty in him as well there. Um but Kendra Washington brings a sort of formidable combination of menace, um, world weariness, and even charm to his role here. And I like those occasional touches of OCD, which add a quirky touch to the character as well. I agree that the location is fantastic looking there. But this story of um, someone standing up for um, the oppressed people in the town, it goes back to the 50s and all that with films like Bad Day at Black Rock and even Billy Jack in the 70s, I think. Um but the script is quite good by Robert Wenk, who's done the other two in the Equalizer series as well. And Anton Fuqua is good at staging lean, mean, and very violent action pieces. Um, I quite enjoyed this film, Alex. I thought it was quite well done. And Annie, that kind of Annie, I almost didn't recognise her here. She's grown yeah, up a lot. I agree with you, Greg. I I, I looked at her and I, I recognised her generally and i thinking, who is she? And it was only when the credits rolled that I thought, oh, yes, she's the one. There we go. So, she's yeah, she great. Was- She's grown she up with, our very old. She worked with Washington um, in 2004's thriller um, Man on Fire as well. She did. She did indeed. And I, I did note that, but uh, she, a different time frame in her life, one one could say. So you, you quite enjoyed it. What about you, Peter? 
Look, I didn't mind this film. It, it's sort of, as as Greg has already mentioned, part of these uh, revenge vigilante type films which go back uh, a number of years. I mean, I, I remember the Charles Bronson Death Wish uh, mm. films, uh, etc. And of course, uh, this film, uh, Equalizer, uh, corresponds to some extent with the John Wick uh, series of films where the, the slow burn revenge vigilante style uh, murder and mayhem approach is uh, so important as part of the plot. It's so interesting to note how you have this beautiful scenery um, contrasted against the uh, the violence that uh, is part of the film, which is staged in a very careful uh, and uh, almost uh, artistic sort of way. I thought, my goodness, they are really looking at violence in a, in an incredible way. Um, look, the whole mafia story, though, I found was a bit tired and a bit obvious. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's it's a film of interest because it wraps up the uh, the three films that are the Equalizer series, especially uh, in the way it concludes. Because if uh, if people remember the first Equalizer film, um, the way this one concludes harks back to that first film without going into any more detail than that. Uh, look, I but you can see it in isolation, and you're not going to you're not going to lose a great deal. You can make sense of it. Uh, yes, you can. You can, except maybe for the final scene, which some audiences, if they haven't seen the first mm. film, uh, may scratch their head saying, uh, "Now, how does that fit into this uh, mafia story?" But nevertheless, it's um, it, it's not a it's not a bad film. It's well shot. It's uh, Denzel Washington is very good as the uh, slow burn vigilante, and uh, uh, look, it it works reasonably well um, as a. Uh, a revenge film, uh, but I just became a little tired of it by the end because we've seen this sort of uh, plot structure before. Yeah, but the, I mean, th th it could be, you could argue it's for people who are stalwarts or you could say it's a new generation, couldn't you? I mean, you you go back in terms of violent movies, as we've said, generations. So uh, Denzel Washington is better than most in, in this sort of role, is he not? Oh look, he's very good. He 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 does it very well, very controlled, very carefully acted uh, sort of performance. And uh, look, I I agree. It's um it's a subgenre that appeals to to some people. I I just get a little bit tired of it. Mm, fair enough. Well, look, let's get some some sentiments. I'll start with a score out of ten for the Equalizer three from Jackie Hamilton in Absentia. Was it absentia? No, absentia with a T. There we go. Seven and a half out of ten from her. I'm giving it a seven out of ten. Greg, seven out of ten. I, I quite enjoyed it too. So you'll be the low ball here, Peter. There you go. I'm telling you this in advance. What are you going to give it? <laughs> Look, I gave it five out of ten. Oh my, Peter! Hang on, you you've just proceeded to say you didn't mind it, and you you're giving it a beer pass. That's uh, right. It's like hitting it over the head with a lettuce leaf. What? What are you doing? No, folks, just you know, if if you're into this sort of thing, it, it's it's definitely. It, you're saying it's a, a decidedly average revenge plot. Is that what you're telling me? Is that is that what you're trying to tell all of us? Decidedly yes. average. That's what I'm saying. With the mafia plot and the tiredness of the uh, uh, of of the story structure, uh, made me give it a five, which is still a pass for me. That's pretty good. Before you go on, Alex, um, do you know how I said this is a different take on the character to the um, Edward Woodward TV series? Yeah. yeah. Um, that reminded me more of a series of books I've been reading lately by a guy called Greg Hurwitz called Orphan X or Nowhere Man about a retired assassin who does the same sort of thing, helping people out in trouble. And he gets um, into all these sort of violent situations in one stage, taking on a Mexican drum cartel. Lovely. See, but I like to say that turned into a series of movies as well. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah, and it will continue. Uh, these things, whether it's this book or something else, this will continue till, mm. uh, until somebody basically pulls down the shutters and says you can't do it because it's too violent. So it, it, I, I just, uh, yeah, anyway... You're, it's spring has sprung, Peter, right? It's a beautiful days outside. So you're saying people should be go, going outside and not going to the cinema. To That's basically what, what a five out of ten is, isn't it? They should not, not have, going. 
Elite, along and seeing Equalizer three because spring has sprung and you're better off outdoors for that for that hundred and nine minutes. Correct? Uh, no, I still say people go to the cinema, but we're going to be talking about a film which uh, is quite a contrast. We are, and we're not talking haunted mansion, but that's that's up next. So you are on JR eighty eight FM listening to Peter castigating film. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're a castigator. Very nice. Uh, is, don't sue me. So, Haunted Mansion, PG, 123 minutes. Now, if you think about Disney, they've got a pretty good track record of turning theme park attractions into cinematic success. I mean, Pirates of the Caribbean would be foremost amongst them, wouldn't they, Peter? You're into that thrill ride, are you? Oh, absolutely. Especially when I'm playing my clavichord. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, but... I, I don't know how much that's taken, but it's billions at the box office. So you'd be hard pressed to find a a uh, a theme park attraction as popular as that in terms of movie making. And now they're making another one, of course, with uh, with a man who, uh, who you know the uh, Sparrow, Jack Sparrow. So anyway, you've got that. Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah, yeah. And then Jungle Cruise as well is the other the other one that uh, comes to mind in terms of a theme park attraction. Anything else? Tomorrowland. To, was to, was Tomorrowland a movie? I can't remember it. Yeah, it was George Clooney. Yep. Ah, uh, yes, it was. Very good. Very good indeed. Okay, and now comes Haunted Mansion. So you got Pirates of the Caribbean, Jungle Cruise, Tomorrowland, Haunted Mansion. Any others before we move on? No? Nothing you can think of? All right. Here we have a widowed doctor from New York, His name, whose name is... Um, Gabby. G- Gabby, yeah. And uh, R- Rosario Dawson plays her. And her nine-year-old son Travis right so who has trouble making friends and basically they moved to New York no to New Orleans not New York the word new got me so okay they they moved to New Orleans and it's where Gabby's mother once actually uh, had a home and they choose an unusually affordable large historic place just outside the city and it's known as Gracie Manor G-R-A-C-E-Y within moments it's clear that the home is haunted Beset by a mix of wild spirits, and some of them are playful, and others are much more menacing. So Gabby decides to get out quick smart. But she and her son soon realise that because they've actually set foot in the home, the apparitions just won't the apparitions rather just won't let them go. So they have to find a way to exorcise the demons, exorcise them, or at the very least learn to, to live with them enter an unpriestly priest called Father Kent, played by Owen Wilson, who enlists the help of various so-called experts to try to rid Gracie Manor of unwanted guests. So Ben Lakeith Stanfield is a former astrophysicist grieving the death of his wife, who that Ben now leads ghost tours of the city, right, of New Orleans. Bruce Davis, played by Danny DeVito, is a university professor with a rather unfortunately bad ticker who is proficient in the haunted history of the city. Harriet Tiffany Haddish is an opportunistic French Quarter medium. Great part of the world. Have you been to the French Quarter, Greg? Uh, Yep. Great part of the world. A colourful, very lively area. Great for jazz. Wonderful. Um, The whole of New Orleans is great for jazz. Anyway, they have got their work cut out for them. I'm talking about all of these people that I've introduced. The father, the astrophysicist, the university professor, and the medium. It's been written by Katie Dippold with direction from Justin Simeon. And Haunted Mansion is quite the wild ride that combines humour with horror and heart. So all the H's there. It's a Look, it's a pretty cheesy romp, if, if we were going to be honest about it. It certainly isn't very scary, although some of the ghosts do leave their mark. Lakeith Stanfield does it. Fine job as the leading figure in the piece. Uh, Ben's life has well and truly derailed since his beloved wife passed away. And this call for help gives him a, a chance to reconnect with the world, which he's really disconnected from. And he basically is living a, a hobo existence. Owen Wilson, well, as a hoot, as the questionable spiritual advisor, bringing a real playful quality to his role. Danny DeVito, I haven't seen him for a while, brings frenzied glee to his representation of the academic. And Tiffany Haddish, well, she introduces a level of indignance to her characterization of a psychic trying to be taken seriously. 
There's a bit of warmth about um, Rosario Dawson as a mother trying to protect her son. And also appreciate the facial expressions that Chase W. Dillon imbues into the primary school teacher, a student, the, the son of Rosario Dawson's character. There's also Jamie Lee Curtis. She plays an ancient psychic trapped in a crystal ball. I mean, she does this well, you know, pops up in movies here or there. And I've got to say that um, we've got a soft spot for Jamie Lee because we named our daughter after her. There you go. All these years later, we can dips our lid to Jamie Lee Curtis. So, Jamie, I've never, Jamie Lee, I've never actually said thank you. Now I can. Uh, look, I, I can't say that the film really sets the world on fire. It's, it's, you know, it's fun. A tad over two hours is is definitely stretched. It did not need to be that long, but look for it. It's worth considering for a younger audience that it's it's clearly aimed at a younger audience and you know, a few laughs here and there, even for the oldie, a more older audience. But um, yeah, I thought it was in Peter's terms average. But my average is a bit better than your average, Peter. So what about your thoughts about Haunted Bank? Look, I didn't mind a haunted. Oh, oh, hang on. A five? Is it a five, Peter? Do we go the other way around here? I didn't mind it. Here we go. The lettuce leaf is out again. <laughs> yeah, we're we're halving the lettuce leaf, right? Yes, I didn't mind it. Well, is, can, you, can you put it in alternate terms? Is there any other sort of negativity that you can throw on this movie <laughs> that you get you can pour cold water on before you even say anything further? We should call today's show the salad show, I think, we because should, it's got lettuce yeah. leaf everywhere. But uh, mm. anyway, I, <laughs> look, I, it, it, considering that the film is based on a ride, which in itself is not necessarily the best uh, instigator of a storyline for a film, uh, I, I didn't... Well, hang on, wait, wait, wait. Did you like the original Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, it was okay, uh, to a point. I didn't mind it. <laughs> oh, golly. Okay. So, sorry, Disney... I... Hang on, they're on they're on um, voice dial straight away for me. Um, uh, sorry, Mister Ms. or uh, They Disney. Um, a, a, a notable critic in Australia doesn't want you to ever make a movie again which starts with a theme park attraction, please. And and he will be forever grateful. Uh, yours sincerely, Ellie. <laughs> What's that? Well, this is a remake of a film based on a theme park ride. Pardon me, Greg. This is even worse. It's a remake of a film. Yes, it is. Oh, so hang on. Uh, is it barely passable, uh, Peter, then, given what Greg's just told us? Well, uh, it is passable because yeah. there is a fair bit of humour injected into the film, which I did appreciate. I thought Owen Wilson's character yeah. and some of the lines in the film were quite amusing. I also liked the, the nod to Ghostbusters with the, uh, all of those ghosts haunting uh, this house, I thought, uh, enough already. But actually, they were quite amusing at times. Yeah. And, and look, uh, I thought the film was okay to a point because it is meant to appeal to a younger audience. It does have that sort of heartwarming aspect to it by the time we get to the resolution. And the actors are very good. I thought it was a, a really good collection of... Uh, of actors and Jamie Lee, I agree with you, was uh, was excellent in her role uh, in this film and uh, the other actors as well. So look, it's not a bad time passer um, for a, a, a reasonable family audience, younger audience. Um, I just wish Disney would start to make films that are a bit more provocative and a bit more original. But overall, I just didn't mind uh, Haunted Mansion. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, speed dial, uh, Disney. Uh, we, we, our, our, our prominent Australian reviewer doesn't think you're pushing the envelope enough. You're playing it safe and wants you to be far more creative. That's that's it. Uh, yours sincerely again, Alex. Correct, Peter? Uh, absolutely. I'll sign that uh, that petition. Oh, ah, right, right. Very good. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll build up thousands of names in no time. <laughs> Fabulous. Greg, did you think anything more of Haunted Mansion? I thought less of it than Peter, I think. Oh, okay. So we, we've got fail coming up. I mean, uh, you're, you're both teachers, uh, you in particular, Greg. Uh, I, I think, uh, Peter, what do you do in schools again? What's your role? I'm a careers counsellor. Right. So don't work. You're moving out of control. So don't work for Disney because they're too conservative. Is this what you tell your kids? I first have to try and get an interview. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Well, hang on, hang on. I've got speed dials, so you can use me for that if you like. There you go. <laughs> go for it, Greg. Tell me what you didn't like about it. While you keep um, Disney on speed dial there, this is how I open my review of it. Disney seem to be lacking in creativity at the moment because all they seem to produce are live-action remakes of their animated classics, endless sequels and spin-offs of some of their successful franchises and films based on their theme park ride. They are did a rather cynical remake of a film based on a spooky theme park ride with this so-so remake of okay, the whole haunted mansion. Don't read the whole review. Talk no, to you me. That's me. I started my review. So yeah. it's, it's all downhill from there. Oh, very good. Is it, hang on, hang on. Is there anything positive you could say about it? Uh, look, I I thought Owen oh, Wilson brought a usual goofy style to the um, performance there. Uh, I thought some, some of the um, special effects were a little bit sulky um, and under par. I thought the Tiffany Haddish character should have been more like Whoopi Goldberg's character in Ghosts. I thought that would have brought a bit more energy to it. I thought the subplot in which um, the Keith Stanfield's character tries to form a connection with Gabby's young son missed, um, brought a bit of emotional heft to the material, but I thought this film was a bit of a misfire. I wasn't sure what audience to aim for because it's not horror enough for horror fans and because it's a family-oriented film, they've toned down a lot of it there. Um, but uh, it's, some of the stuff might be a bit too dark or over the head for younger kids there. And as I said... It's a bit too long too. I thought it ran ran too long and ran out of puff long before the climax. Um, and the special effects I thought were a little bit underwhelming. And Peter referenced Ghostbusters there. You can see why that sort of reference is there because Katie Gippold wrote the female centric version of Ghostbusters. Yeah, which was not the movie that Ghostbusters was, was it? No, no, so, it was... Yeah, I didn't like it much. Yeah, no, you clear... Lines. clear clearly not, <laughs> unfortunately. So, okay, so. Well, I suppose we'll start with you then for a score for Haunted Mansion, PG rated 123 minutes. Are you passing it or failing it? Me? I'm going to give it 4 out of 10. Fail. F, red, red marks everywhere. There's going to be lots of people crying into their bickies. All Take right. That, Pardon me? Take that, Yuzi. Uh, wow. Kapow. Hang on. We're going back to Batman days on the screen. What other, what other, what other invective do we put on the screen, Greg, apart from kapow? Wham? You bam. Socket. Very good. Okay. So we mail Batman. Nice, nice. Peter, what what uh, would you like to? What, you're going to give it a, at least a five, aren't you? Well, a, a bit of a surprise for me is that I uh, I although I acknowledge a lot of uh, what Greg said, uh, I I thought this was an okay sort of film, and I gave it six out of ten. It's not. Oh my golly! Bad. Will wonders never cease? So are you thawing? Are you gradually sort of you know, get, get the fact that it's three in the morning? No, you, it's very good. Very good into it. So I'm giving it a six as well. There, there we go. And I, I, Jackie didn't see this one or I haven't got a comment from her. So we're going to have to leave it at that point. Now we are going to go to a movie that I'm sure all of us will have liked a lot more. And you are on JR, 88 FM, intelligent programming apart from this show. No, for 24 hours a day. Is that right, Peter? Yes, that's good. Yeah, very good, yeah. So, look, folks, if you want to support us, I mean, you, you know, basically you can become a subscriber. That That's nice. I think it's 54 bucks a year. Is it 54? I, I, I haven't checked lately. I believe it's 54 bucks a year. And you support community radio and all of the, the good stuff and uh, the music that the station programs it relies upon communal support. So please, if you are able to, keep us going. That would be very, very nice. And we can keep... to. Talking the nonsense that we do. Let's talk about past lives. Now, what were you in a former life? Uh, you were obviously a football coach, Peter. <laughs> Absolutely. Or maybe I was just a wet salad. Yeah, maybe you were a wet salad. I, you could have been You could have been Caesar or you could have been Bonaparte. Any of those historic characters, do you think? You know, maybe somewhere. Well, mind you, you could have been, you could have, you're, you're um, influenced heavily by German cinema. So who in Germany could you have been? Uh, what, what, what sort of uh, hero in, in uh, Germany? Who would you have Goethe. liked to have been in past life? Goethe. Goethe. Ah, very good, because of the Institute. Okay. Now, Greg, I'll ask you the question. Uh, you, uh, you've got various interests, like you, you're, you're a very prolific reader. So would you have liked to have been a, a, an author of some renown in a past life? Possibly could have been, yes, writing adventure stories like um, 
Charles Dickens or um, oh. H.G. Wells or someone like that, or Jules Verne. What, ab- what about the evocation that you get in Joseph Conrad, who, who writes stories about the ocean, which makes up two-thirds of the planet? I mean, he was a, he was a fiery writer as well. So, I mean, yeah. I'm a little seasick. He probably, well, it, yeah, so, okay, uh, I, I'm not trying to delve too deeply into your personal life. Do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe that we have had past lives, Greg? Possibly. Uh, no. No, Peter? Um, uh, not not sure. The the jury is out. I mean, the Buddhist philosophy is not a bad one. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right, past lives is M-rated, runs for 106 minutes, and they were high-achieving 12-year-old friends in their native South Korea, and then one left with her family for a new life in North America. Past lives is the story of the ties between this pair, the two 12-year-olds who are growing up in different parts of the world. Now, Nora, played by Moon Seong Ah as a child and Greta Lee as an adult, which is the English name that this young lady took, Nora, and Hae Sun, S-U-N-G, Hae Sung, Leem Sung Min as a child and Tio Yu as an adult. They're the, they're the two characters, Nora and Hae Sung. And they forged a strong bond in South Korea. And who knows what could have been if they had remained there. But as it was, she did not. She aspired to achieve world acclaim. She became a playwright, he an engineer. Neither forgot about each other, but they moved on with their lives. Hae Sung tried to find her. So the male tried to find the female. But that wasn't easy because she'd anglicised her name, as I mentioned. Then after 12 years had come and gone, he re- reached out to her through her father's Facebook page. And the father of Nora is or was and, and was still a filmmaker. Now, I've got to ask at this point, why did he wait for 12 years? But there you go, to, to go onto the Facebook page, or was there an, a eureka moment? Maybe one of you can answer that. Can you, any of you, as to why 12 years had gone by? Or was that just a filmic plot? No. Or... Okay. I think it was a plot, but it was also about the, the two of them wanting to leave separate lives. As oh, well. yeah, I understand. So it was a device. Anyway, once they reconnected, they disconnected again for another 12 years before meeting face-to-face. Another device, Peter? Indeed. Possibly. Possibly. All right. Also in the picture is another person of significance in Nora's life, and I'm very, very careful about not saying too much here. So Greg and Peter, be cognizant of that. I'm sure you are. That other person is Arthur, played by John Magaro. So Past Lives is this really sensitive and moving story of possibility, the essence of which is choosing one life means leaving behind another. Although, honestly, as a 12-year-old, if your parents are deciding to move, you're hardly likely to stay behind, so I'm not sure how much of a choice it was. But Celine Song's cinematic debut makes a really strong statement. It's reflective of her own life. I mean, one night a few years ago, She found herself sitting at a bar. This is not just a war story. She was sitting at a bar, sandwiched between a couple of men from different parts of her life. And playing both translator and middleman, she felt she was piercing through alternate dimensions. Both men loved her in different languages and cultures. So let's talk a little bit about her because, as I say, this is her first movie. She's a mainstay as a playwright in New York theatre. So look at the creation of the character that she's created here in Nora, who happens to be somebody who's a playwright, right? Close to, close to real life, yeah? Uh, so I, look, look, why, why wouldn't you write about what you know about, it, especially if it's such a, a remarkable story? And um, so there you have it, the inspiration for her first screenplay, which um, I dare say won't be her last because this is already getting early Oscar buzz. Past Lives is really well realised. It's a slow-moving drama romance, and it asks questions, it really does, about happenstance and what was meant to be. It queries whether the person you know as a child is still the same person as an adult. And the undoubted star of the piece is Greta Lee. She's so natural in her realisation of Nora. No airs, no graces, no pretense, authenticity. That's what makes her so compelling. T.O.U., more reserved in his characterization of Hei Sung. John Magaro also walks in Nora's shadow as a fellow writer. Song is really careful to take her time in revealing the full picture. At times, I would have liked the pace to have been 
slightly quickened, but I also appreciated the originality that um, she brought to bear in making this movie. It looked and felt real. It never deviated from this ideal. I give it great credit, and I'm really looking forward to Celine Song's next movie already because this is a very fine piece of movie making. Is it not, Peter? Absolutely. In fact, I found this film absolutely mesmerising throughout. It's uh, such a beautifully controlled story, uh, which is partly uh, autobiographical. Um, but the, the characters involved and, and their um, uh, origin story, so to speak, when they uh, with their childhood friends and how that evolves over time in terms of their own uh, career trajectories, their own uh, other relationships or other uh, aspects of their lives as they grow up in sort of 12-year intervals. I thought this was such a beautifully written and directed film, uh, beautifully paced. I thought the pacing was absolutely superb. It was just right for the characters, for the uh, emotional development of these people without being melodramatic. It it was just such a, a fascinating story, and the way it sort of concludes was just, uh, again, um, absolutely spot on for me. Absolutely love this film. It's already gone on my list as one of the best films of the year. Mm, de delightful. So, yeah, we've, we've turned tail from, oh, I didn't mind it, to ecstatic. Fabulous. We've, we've got you into the right frame of mind. Uh, Greg, are you going to be extolling the virtues of this movie as much as Peter? Not yet, because I haven't seen it yet. Well, then then you can just imagine, right? Yeah, you know, last <laughs> life, you can imagine, can you not? I, I'm, I'm then going to rely upon Jackie Hamilton, who has seen this one, and she says it was utterly engaging, exquisitely crafted, emotionally intelligent, finely tuned and acted. So finely tuned and acted. So she And she, she drew me a heart. I don't think she drew me a heart, but she drew the film a heart uh, and coloured it in. So there we go. I Look, I, I'm going to go... It's, I'm not going to be as high in my praise as you are. I really liked it, but I'm going to give it a 7.5 to an 8 out of 10. This is past lives, and both Jackie and you, Peter, will be giving it much higher marks. So this is rated M, 106 minutes. Now, Jackie's giving it a 9 out of 10, and I suspect you will be giving it a similar mark at least, will you not, Peter? This, uh, as I said, is one of the best films of the year, and it's one of my 10 out of 10 films. Wow. One of your 10 out of 10. I, I've had one 10 out of 10 film in, I think, about 20 years. You've had how many? It's like hot dinners for you, is it, Peter? <laughs> and a salad on top. And salad on top. Of course it was salad. That's what today's been all about. It is. No, I, ha I probably have about uh, three or four 10 out of 10 films each year. Have we had any of them this year? I don't. Have we had any? Did you look Oppenheimer? I can't remember. No, you didn't give 10. To I, I think I gave it a nine. Yeah, exactly. So you haven't had any 10 films this year yet? Um, I have, have to review to... my list and you I don't... Review a... your review. You have to review your reviews, do you? Very nice. I do. And I have to look at my list and I know that there's a few films coming up which may well um, oh. be at the top of the list as well. Well, teasers. Go on, give us one that you might think will get there, get there for you, apart from... Ma Ma Martin Scorsese's new film looks absolutely fascinating in terms of the, uh, the trailer. Uh, Killers of the... Uh, Autumn Moon or whatever it's called. Ah, yes, 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 it does. Excellent. All right. Well, that is it for film. I'm going to talk about Moulin Rouge, the musical. Quite the spectacle. Uh, Peter, have you... No, not, but you're not, you don't see anything like this, do you? Uh, what about you, Greg? Have you seen it in its previous iteration in, in at the Regent Theatre? I haven't seen it at the Regent Theatre, no. And while you're talking about that, I got an email this week saying that Tina... The, when it's only musical, it's coming to Melbourne this year, Al. Yeah, I, I, I got that as well. But it's late. It's much later in the year. We've got to wait, wait about a year, don't we, before we see it. But it, it's great. It's terrific. And I know you you enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned it. Look out for Tina Turner's musical. I'm not, is it called Tina? I think, without the Turner. I think. Anyway, um, we can, we can uh, I can verify that uh, it's called Tina, the Tina Turner musical. Now, this one, well, where's the musical? It is a liquefying, it's energy on steroids, and it, it really triumphs in you because it was here, what, just over a year, about a year ago, wasn't it? I think we, 
when I last saw it. I can't remember the exact time frame, but it's a rolled gold winner. It keeps on delivering the staging, the costuming and the lighting, the music, the sound, the choreography are magnificent. Quite awe-inspiring. And the, the performers metaphorically lift the roof off one of the world's great theatres, the Regent. Now, you've been at the Regent, haven't you, Greg, in the past? Yeah, I have. It is, isn't it fabulous? The, I, I can't think of a, a theatre I enjoy going to more. And the space between seats is brilliant, isn't it? Mm-hmm. No? You don't remember? Yeah. Okay. It, are you, are you, have you borrowed uh, Peter's lettuce leaf, have you? <laughs> yeah. I said, re- I'm recycling. You, you, yeah, very good. Okay. The chorus numbers in Moulin Rouge, the musical, just build. They, they build and they build. And time and again, the audience is whipped into this frenzy, right? The acclamation is instant. It's heartfelt. It's enduring as song after song. I mean, you've got more than 70 songs from 160 songwriters representing over 160 years of music. The, the word wow comes to mind. They're mashed together in two hours and 15 minutes of prolific entertainment. And look, the impact of this is just extraordinary. The excitement is palpable, a showcase of hit after glorious hit. So you, you often get one line and then a line of a different song. It, it's amazing. Moulin Rouge, the musical, 10-time Tony Award-winning jukebox musical based on the 2001 Baz Luhrmann movie with added songs. Anyway. It concerns the problematic, tumultuous love affair between a young, penniless singer-songwriter and a showgirl. And it's set at the turn of the 20th century. There's an American called Christian, played by Des Flanagan, just arrived in Paris and heads straight for Montmartre. And he chances upon a couple of artistes, Deleuze Lautrec, played by Bert Lebont, and Santiago, Ryan Gonzalez. They are part of the Bohemian movement. And they're looking to compose a new play with songs. But they're having real trouble with the lyrics. And that's where Christian helps them out. And in return, they encourage him to visit the Moulin Rouge Cabaret, birthplace of the modern can-can. They would like the impresario Harold Zeidler, Zeidler with a D, played by Simon Burke, to stage their show at the venue. Their ploy is for Christian to sweet-talk leading lady Satine, Alinta Chidzi, who is a former courtesan, into convincing Zeidler to do just that, to play their show. Only what they don't realise is that Zeidler is in serious debt and the club is on the cusp of closing. So to that end, Zeidler hopes to call upon wealthy but arrogant the Duke, James Briars, to bail them out, to bail the club out so that they continue to thrive or survive and then thrive. Zeidler too is using Satine as bait. Because the moment they see her, both Christian and the Duke are smitten. Only the Duke wants Satine all to himself. And he's used to getting his way or else. Da-da-da-da. There you go. That is the Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge, the musical. Having said all of that, Alinta Chidzi dazzles in the lead. A torn at times forlorn figure who shines like a sparkling diamond, which is a line in the film, the mo- in the movie and also in the show. The moment she's lowered onto the stage because she comes she she comes from above. Dance Flanagan wears his heart on his sleeve. That's the only way to do it. Very, very good. Uh, as the, I mean, he, he's, it's really a, a bold, persistent and love-struck pursuer. James Bryars is imposing and menacing. Simon Burke, all about affectations, brings swagger to the Moulin Rouge mover and shaker, and I was really taken by the nuances in character that Bert LeBont brought to Toulouse Le Trek. He was a standout for me. Ryan Gonzalez, a showstopper, alongside no-nonsense performer Ninny, Samantha Donamade, as the pair hit it out of the park at the start of Act 2, and uh, the staging, set changes are prolific, they're seamless. Red and black predominate! Go the mighty dons! But really, it's a cavalcade of colour and movement, costuming to die for, choreography hypnotising, as good as you can get, I just urge you to see what is a really dynamic production. Leaves everything on the stage. Masterful. Playing at the Regent Theatre until the end of this year. End of 2023. That is Moulin Rouge, the musical at a Regent Theatre. And that's it for the day. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Gregory. And for your sake, Greg, can the Saints. Is that right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> see you next week, folks. Be well. <laughs> Catch you later. <laughs>